There we go. That's the ticket. Thank you very much, Jono. Yeah, I realized something was off there. Haha. <laughs> All right, one more time. What's up and a very warm welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. The sun is shining and the magpie is casting. Come at you all this July the 6th from a slightly relaxed lockdown as it is now in England. Um, and uh, we've got some prime RTS action to be getting around to here momentarily. We're going to kick it off, actually, in a slight schedule change with some deserts of Karak. And then move on in to our regular programming of Company of Heroes 2. Let's have a look at what I'm going to be casting this week. So obviously right now at 1200 hours GMT as advertised, present and correct. And also on Wednesday and Thursday in the evening this week. That's what we're going to be doing. Um, so yeah, very much look forward to seeing you all at those times. Or if not, uh, you can catch the VODs at youtube.com slash magpie842. So as I get us ready to load on in to this game... Um, Ba -ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da. Let's uh, let's head straight in. We've got a fantastic replay here. Um, it's going to be a rare example of a Saban mirror. Uh, we're going to have a game Anx versus Shiraiki. And uh, yeah, I figure I figure at the moment it's um I'm just going to start off with Deserts of Karak and just see how it feels putting that one at the front of the stream instead of at the back. Um, if you are a Company of Heroes 2 fan who has been enjoying the Company of Heroes 2 casts and is tuning in now, firstly thank you very much, and secondly. Um, do stay tuned. Games of Deserts of Karak do not last forever, and I mean, by which I mean they don't even. Oh no! In kind of the synchronization error. Say what? What are we getting on with that? Oh, okay. Well, we'll try this one more time. But that doesn't bode well. Hmm. That's bizarre. Uh, I mean, I've got plenty more replays that we can look for, but Shrike versus A game in a Saban mirror. I was very much interested in casting. I don't know why that's not working. Um, we'll just give it one more shot. It's a sign. Nope, that's that's just a note. Seems like that particular replay not actually working. Uh, in which case, sorry about this. Uh, technical issues, ahoy. Please do bear with me. We're just going to load in another replay, but it does take me a second as I have to manually put the files into place. Anybody, anyway. I hope everybody's had a good week out there. Um, I myself most certainly have, because I've been playing Titanfall 2, and that is ridiculously good. Uh, oh, could it be that we... Uh, it could be this. Alright, we're going to try that. Hang on, let me just see if this is going to work. We've got to refresh this. Okay, hold up. We might, we might be able to get this, might be able to get this game to work. Fingers crossed. Dude, wow, look at us go. We're up to like double figures of viewers already inside of like no time. Thank you very much everybody for tuning in. That is so cool. <laughs> it's been like four minutes into the stream. Yeah, it's what we like. All right, let's see now. Is it going to have a synchronization error? No, we actually got the game. Okay, I fixed it. I fixed it. Awesome. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and bring everybody into the game <clears throat> alrighty then spawning in the south here playing as the blue Saban forces it is going to be Shirek and spawning in the north uh, I believe this is Firebase Krill as well this map uh, I'm pretty sure I don't know my map knowledge is like super rusty in this game but anyway spawning in the north here as the actually red Saban it's going to be a game Manx. So that is kind of strange I'm used to seeing a game playing in the black colors but uh, not going to be the case today so let's see what these two players have got lined up for us of course Saban the faction uh, a variation of coalition a sub faction if you will with some very interesting twists they have um different rail guns. Uh, they actually even get rail guns on the carrier, which is kind of nuts. Um, and they get the armed logistics modules, so kind of like supply depots that fire out EMP rounds. You can do some fun things with them. I've even seen ALM rushes in the past. Looks like Shrike is going to send the base runner out onto the map deploying the scout here, the probe, uh, and is going to wait for the artifacts to spawn here in mid. I believe A-game... Actually, no, A-game does have the base runner. Ah, I thought that it was a, a retired base runner because... That is weird. Why is A game not doing a probe scout? That seems strange to me. Okay, there, there the probe comes. 
I wonder why you delay a probe scout there, though. There must be a really good reason. I wouldn't know because I never play as Coalition or Saban. I just... I don't even know... To, what does this ability cost? Does it cost anything? It costs 100 CUs. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, and it has a 30 second cooldown. Very interesting. I actually, I actually thought that that was free. I did not know that it costs 100. Alright. Alright, I guess it's not as busted as I thought. <laughs> sometimes... Sometimes if you only play Galzian and Kanef, which that is all I ever play, uh, you, uh, sometimes you do just sort of look at some of the things Coalition do without a full understanding and you're just like, well this stuff's busted, like what the hell, you know? Um, but okay, that actually costs 100 to use, that's actually really interesting to know, cool. Um, so, looks like uh, the first LAV going to be making its way out onto the field here for A-game Anks. Uh, looks like he's going to be following that up with AAV Fabrication. Shrike is about, what is that, like 30 seconds ahead on the research? Um, so, da -da -da, so, we've already got the support crews out for the both. I'm, I'm just guessing that... So, A-game has, what, nine harvesters. Shrike has also nine. So, Shrike just seems to be ahead, but I get the feeling that A-game has built or snuck something in that Shrike did not. Anyway... The first shots get fired at anger here as the uh, a the LAV of uh, A game Anx starts chipping in on this uh, base runner, which is extracting an artifact. The jammer comes down. Wow, how much does the jammer cost then? That is that is actually free. That is an 80 second cooldown ability there. Just going to be um, what it, what it does is it's like an AOE radius, and units within that radius cannot shoot. Um, so that's just going to be used there to try and just save a little bit of damage on this base runner. I mean, you might as well click the button. It is largely ineffective when you're fighting just LAVs, but you know, you uh, there's not too much that the base runner can do to defend itself there. Actually, does it not have the turret? So it only has the AA turret. Okay, it doesn't get the regular turret. Um, that's the uh, the difference there with Saban. So Shrike here going to take the lead, securing an artifact that gives him one chip of power to spend on his carrier later on. And uh, also, obviously, slants the scoreline in his favor. Favor. Two more artifacts, of course, on the map still to be scored. Uh, A-game probing around with a base runner, but not actually making a grab right now. Emadaranki, what's going on? Indeed, starting with the Deserts of Karak today. Just thought I'd mix it up a little bit and uh, see how the casts sort of... See how the pace and the tone of the casts go if I put Deserts of Karak at the beginning uh, instead of at the end. Um, so, yep, that's, uh, that's, that's what we're doing today. So, these two players, by the way, they're being super respectful. Look at this. The second support cruiser comes out, so A-game here is going to be going up to three mining locations. Looks like for Shrike... Actually, is it just me? Where is Shrike's third production... Where, where is Shrike's third support cruiser? There is no support cruiser, and there's none on the production tab. So, uh... Okay, I actually thought that these players were being super respectful and keeping pace, but, like... Shrike actually, okay, now, only just now building the third production crew and cancelling it? Wow. I mean, if Shrike doesn't commit to a third, uh, sorry, a second support cruiser, I keep calling them production cruisers because I play too much Galaxian and Kanaf. Okay, if, if Shrike doesn't go up to three mining locations soon, though, it's going to be so far behind. This looks like super bad. Yeah, Emma Duranke, all the games I cast are indeed on the community patch. Yeah. Um, of which I'm not the most knowledgeable on the actual patch notes. Because um, patch notes, they're like kind of for noobs, right? I mean, like, why would I, an RTS caster, need to concern myself with such lowly things as patch notes? Um, so, alright. These armored assaults here for Shrike gonna be getting some harass here. Actually only picking up a targeting jammer, but it looks like he tried to harass an ALM here. But I mean, there's enough stuff here for A-game that this shouldn't be consequential. There's an armored assault, there's four LAVs, another armored assault heading over. So I don't think this is going to get much done. A game here gets eyes on the fact that he is significantly far ahead in the economy, scouting that there's no mining going on at that third location for uh, Shrike just yet. The carrier is just lumbering over there, so the mining will start there. But A game way further ahead in terms of uh, number of, number of salvagers working and uh, and how how quickly he's accessed these sites. So we ought to see A game come out here looking pretty strong. You can already kind of get a feeling for that. Actually, three strike fighters coming out. So okay, Shrike Shrike has been building uh, and massing up some air power here and there are actually no anti-air resources out here so what are we going to do harass harvesters or go for the rail guns we are harassing harvesters right now and so here we go the strike fighters here unleashing their uh, air to ground missiles causing some decent amounts of splash here oh wow look at the timing on that missile battery though a game uh, only off by a couple of seconds on getting the anti-air response out so two missile batteries are now out and the anti-air the surface-to-air missiles here are going to be bringing down some of Shrike's aircraft, losing just one of them, actually. 
And picking off was did he only get one harvester? I think he actually only got one harvester. Uh, maybe two. I wasn't really paying too close of attention. Um, so, I don't know. That's probably acceptable for like one strike fighter, but not ideal. Um, and now, this has to be one of the most standoffish, respectful games ever. Is this just what Saban vs. Saban looks like? It's. I mean, I reckon probably. I don't have access to the to the statistics, but if I had to guess. I would say that Saban is probably the least played faction in the game, and that means that the Saban Mirror is probably the rarest matchup in the game. Um, so, do I have a general idea of the changes? Uh, hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I do. Uh, essentially, I mean, the balance goal is kind of the same as it is with the Company of Heroes 2 community balance team. Um, it is basically just to make all of the units viable and do their role effectively in the game. So a lot of things have changed, like for example the gunship now deals like AoE damage in quite a large radius and it deals like quite relatively slow DPS but over a large radius so like it's much more of a sort of carpet shooter than it is a sort of target sniper. Um, and that gives it a proper place in the meta and it feels really cool and various research times and costs have been tweaked so that things that need to be pokey feel pokey and things that need to come out fast come out fast. Um, the balance between um, these LAVs and sand skimmers has been like massively changed. Massively changed because in the game's release form sand skimmers were just like way too good. So um, yeah LAVs are actually really good now. AAVs actually likewise. I would say AAVs are just way better than assault ships now. Um, AAVs are like... The smoke is so good um, and the gun is, is pretty decent as well and they can absorb so much damage. Their armor is like amazing. Um, but the real person to ask if you want to know about the balance changes is A Game Angst or you can head onto the community discord and there's a link there to the, uh, to the balance patch notes but uh, it's many pages long. Many things have been changed. Um, but, oh, nice cluster mortar there, and another. But if I had to sum it up, Emma Derenke, I would just say that all of the units now basically act like their best version of themselves. Um, that's pretty much where we're at. Whoa, quad railgun here for Shrike. Getting pounced upon, there's very little in the way of support. These armored assaults are just not in the hood. They need to cycle in, but already two of the railguns go down for Shrike. A-game sharking around with these Saban railguns. Uh, this... Armored Assault will probably be forfeit, this smoke isn't going to last very long, and as soon as it fades, there's a lot of railguns with high ground advantage here. Oh no, Shrike! Oh no, what are we doing? Shrike moving out with these railguns on the wrong side of the sand dune here. Um, actually is able to get a trade there, so that's not the end of the world, and is producing right here another wall of Armored Assault's going to be sliding out here. Let me just quickly check, so Artillery Cruiser is going to be the route which A game wants to take this game down and that does make sense. Already having an Assault Cruiser out actually, so that's going to be a relatively potent, probably harass option. He's probably going to throw this down this flank and try and get some work done in a place that he knows that Shrike's army is not. Um, so... Uh, actually, Shrike kind of pushing the issue here. A Game's army getting a little bit hounded here across the open as the railguns from Shrike continuing to find good damage. Uh, mm, a lot of units damaged here, very few on death's door. If he can actually get these armored assaults in range, he could start suppressing the movement of some of these and then they would be easy kills. It's kind of a little bit like Marauders with concussive shells. AAVs just kind of uh, like slow units down once they get that chain gun ripping on them. Artillery guy, 155 millimeters. Yes, indeed. This game does look interesting. Do you mean Deserts of Karak or specifically this game between Shrike and A game? Um, so, okay, a ball of LAVs is going to come through for a dive here, but the, and, and they find an exposed uh, exposed set of railguns here. The carrier is here to defend, but the Saban carrier actually not the best at defending against LAVs. The strike craft are going to scramble here to try and use the, uh, the, the missiles to pick off these LAVs, but the focus fire is starting to come down from A game now. One of these railguns getting super low. Is he going to get it? It looks like he actually may not get it. The strike fighters being instrumental in holding that defense. Meanwhile, Shrike actually leading the assault. Railguns in a masterful position with high ground advantage. Cluster mortars coming down from A game, but it's not going to be enough. The armored assault's ripping forwards here. Smoke comes down. Actually, is Shrike overextending? For every meter he pushes forward, he's exposing himself to these railguns a little more. So those are, those... Those uh, armored assaults are just done for now. There's no no hope for them. Picks off a base runner, picks off a couple of other units. Going to be focusing salvagers, I think. Yeah, look, I can see some dead salvagers around here. So that was quite nice. These railguns are going to head for the hills. A game still with no air tech. 
Um, so no fast moving option to pick off these rail guns. But A game is actually going into artillery cruisers, right? Okay, and here comes that assault cruiser going to be lobbing down the flank like I kind of thought it might earlier on. Actually, I don't know what it's been doing up until now. Um, just like chilling or actually I think it has been deflecting some armored assaults that were down here in the south, but I just didn't have it on there. Um, what's the name of it? Um, this is Homeworld, Deserts of Karak. Um, and it is just one of the best RTSs. It's super cool. Um, and you can also get it for like almost like, it's like $5 right now on the Steam sale. So it's super worth it, my friend. If you like RTS, this game is a real good one. Anyway, all right, looks like the railgun's in north here. Getting hunted down by a pack of LAVs. We may see the strike craft um, scramble here. It looks like an ALM as well going to be popped out here from strike to suppress these LAVs. So that ALM here. Actually, there's no line of sight for the ALM. It's being blocked by this sand dune. So that's a problem. Um, in south, it looks like the assault cruiser is getting hounded. Quad railgun on the spine of the sand dune with the high ground advantage will make light work of the assault cruiser. And that one is going to sink into the sand with an almighty blast here. Nice kill there. Shrike holding his own. Let's have a look at the defense in the north. So the ALM gets overrun. Ah, he's going to hemorrhage these railguns. There is actually just not enough here to hold. Uh, looks like armored assaults are going to get produced from the carrier, but it's not going to be in time. And I mean, this is essentially an even game. Let's just quickly check the tech again. I feel like there's going to be a ground battle coming up here. You can see already both players are sort of massing forces for a large ground battle. And when that battle comes down, I feel like, yeah, here comes the artillery cruiser. A-game's going to have the advantage because in a Saban versus Saban, uh, the um, artillery cruiser actually is like really good because Saban armies are not fast. So the artillery cruiser is really good. It also counters Saban's like key unit, the railgun. Um, and... The, the Saban railgun, I mean, no rail, no heavy railguns are fast, but, like, the Saban railgun is really, really sluggish. So that artillery cruiser should have a pretty easy time hitting that. Connex, no. You might be surprised to find out that this is not Company of Heroes 2. Um, this is Homeworld Deserts of Karak. But don't worry, buddy. We'll be casting some Company of Heroes 2 in a sec. So, okay. As we approach half-time in this game, the uh, artillery cruisers are lining up. A-game is looking super set. This has been such a respectful game, though. Both players only committing minimal assets to little bits of harass and a kind of little bit of argy-bargy in the north of the map here. Shrike still with this one artifact lead, but that has been it as far as objective-based play goes. And, I mean, we're going to see a ground war here, but I don't see how Shrike can take it. Uh... Okay, now I do. Okay, sorry. Shrike actually has power reserve level 4. This carrier is considerably weaponized. A-game's carrier, not at all weaponized. So, obviously having a carrier with all of its might in the fight is going to be pretty effective here. That's a tactical nuke. Oh dear. Oh god. Oh, of course it's not a tactical nuke. It's the microwave emitter. It's Saban. Ha ha ha, I totally forgot. Okay, so the microwave emitter, a massive damage over time, but A-game pre-splitting nicely actually gets out of there with minimal damage. Artillery cruisers raining hell. This is what I was worried about for Shrike's army. Look at these rockets just flailing in, taking a gruesome toll on Shrike's army here. The carrier, remember the Saban carrier does have railguns and they are, it is angry now. He's poking across the middle ground here, but this is still his carrier and he's still pushing into railguns. So I guess if he can tank with the carrier and let his remaining ball of railguns do the work here, he can actually look to take a pretty smart fight. And that is actually happening, scoring great hits on the railguns, pushing the artillery cruisers back. Does he, has he already picked off an artillery cruiser here? It seems like he actually has. I must have missed that. A game though, massing for a poke in the north as well. But it, is it going to matter? If Shrike takes this fight, Shrike will win. The carrier for A-game is stuck down here. So this is it. It all comes down to this engagement. Unless A-game decides to transition those forces in the north down to help. And that might not be the worst decision yet. Railguns for A-game finding good hits on the carrier. The, the A-game's carrier as well is also in a really good position. Where it's actually super hard to hit with all of these railguns that Shrike has. Support crews are coming out in the middle of the fight here. Going to help repair this carrier. Uh, an A game just with no power reserve. So if all of the units take each other out, 
Shrike for sure will win. Now A Games Assault becomes present, uh, becomes becomes noticed here. Shrike going to get knowledge of what's going on up there. The ALM providing vision of that, and I feel like Shrike just kind of doesn't have much steam left. <gasps> Battle cruiser. Okay, I take it back. Shrike is actually dumping battle cruisers out of his carrier into this fight. The 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 horrendous Saban battle cruiser, which has like quad railgun turret on the go, Ugh! just going to be hosing rails into this army. But I mean. Even with all its health and with all its armor, there's just so many railguns for A-game back here. I don't feel like these battle crews are going to be able to do anything. And he's not being able to focus down the carrier, so I feel like A-game actually has probably weathered this. Uh, I don't want to say that this is over when it's not. Wow, Shrike using some smoke there to save that battle cruiser, but getting wailed on. Just, oh god. There, there can be no victory here, surely. What are we doing? These railguns for A-game have been firing for so long, getting so much value, going unanswered now. The third mining location of Shrike gets shut down as missile batteries and armored assaults going to rip on through that location. Another microwave emitter comes down. This one's much more problematic because A-game is kind of pinned up against the edge of the map, so that actually scores a ton of damage across a lot of units here. Oh god, that's really annoying. Wow, it continues to sap the carrier actually. That's really annoying, so Shrike may not be done yet. A-game's carrier now down to about a third of its health. That's the opportunity that Shrike is looking for. If Shrike can find a position where his carrier can just draw a consistent line of sight onto A-Game's carrier, this game could be his. Uh, looks like A-Game's Assault here just continuing to rip through the backfield. Very little in the way of defense still. The armored assault's daggering away. The missile batteries launching cluster mortars. And, okay, the, the carrier gets flustered, and that will be game, yeah. A-Game -A -A forced to try and run away and gets railgunned down by Shrike's carrier assault. So there we go. Wow. That is that is that is the power of having weaponized your carrier when your opponent has not. And Shrike is able to convert that. Nice railgun rush. Uh on the carrier. Well, it's not really a railgun rush then, is it? Ha! <laughs> nice nice carrier assault though, is what I mean. Um gonna be converting into a lovely win there for for Shrike. Wow. Huh. I feel like I'm there's definitely I mean that might be one of the very few Saban versus Saban that I've ever cast, and I really feel like I don't understand the matchup at all at the moment so like for the first 10 or 15 minutes of that game like both of the players were being so respectful uh what's that about does Saban just not have good like offensive poking options because I just feel like a game made a sort of decent attempt to poke through into the north but like apart from that and there was the one um airborne assault from Shrike but I mean Apart from that, it seems like both players just get to build up their stuff and then have at it. And then, and if that's going to be, if that's going to be the texture of the game, if that's how the matchup plays, I'm kind of a little bit surprised to see a game just so far behind in terms of carrier development. I appreciate it had more railguns, and I appreciate it had artillery cruiser tech, and I appreciate both of those things were useful. But they don't seem to eclipse carrier tech, like certainly not being outdone by four or five power levels and Shrike there getting a masterful microwave emitter out as well actually that was pretty cool so nice that was some good stuff hey creative name what's going on good to see you in, in chat there friend Datton as well and uh who else we got here pineapple fruit everybody's everybody's showing up thank you very much for tuning in today everyone it means a lot to me we're uh still technically in lockdown although it has been sort of um relaxed in this country what is my hair doing there it kind of looks like i'm going bald or something look at that i've got a little a little bald spot there huh um yeah so uh, still in lockdown still casting to maintain my sanity um but uh yeah the lockdown's been relaxed a little bit but it's like i don't know i mean the virus is still out there in like massive numbers so i'm, I'm still being pretty cautious personally all right, let's have a look at who we've got playing on the ladder today. Ooh, that looks like a good one to get us underway. Okay, all right. Well, we're going to load into a game of Company of Heroes 2 here as I pour myself a cup of tea. Yeah, I think one of the funniest things, because for some reason in England, they decided to reopen the pubs, even though in America they did that, and it's like terrible. I mean, I've looked at the graphs about what happened in Texas and other states where they reopen pubs and things, and it's like doesn't work in a pandemic and then like the the is soon uh, like immediately after saturday night when literally crowds of people in england like pressed up against each other in a drunken mess like just were celebrating in the streets like the chief of police of england was just like drunk people cannot socially distance they are not capable of it and everyone was just like no no they're not <laughs> 
Uh, so, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready for some Company of Heroes 2 action. Let's introduce you to the two players playing for our amusement, entertainment, and uh, and just, well, yeah, basically those two things today. <laughs> spawning in the south here, playing as the OKW forces, it is Ihito. And spawning in the north as the United States forces, going to be choosing the, oh man, I always forget what this guy is called. It's like the new US commander. What is this guy? Urban Assault Company. Yep. Going to be that one. Uh, it is going to be Sturm Tiger. Yep. Uh, who has actually brought some interesting games um, on the channel in recent times. So Urban Assault Company. You get the Urban Assault Kits, which is kind of like Molotovs and Rifle Grenade Launchers on Rear Ash. Uh, you get the M4A3 Sherman Assault Package. That's the Dozer Blade. Cool. You get Rangers, who are very useful. You get Cover to Cover, Smoke Drops, and All Infantry Move with Increased Speed. Very interesting. And you get that Sherman Calliope, uh, a rocket artillery unit, of course, which uh, USF do not typically have access to. And it does always interest me. I am always... I am always open to commanders who bring things that the faction doesn't normally get. Just lets you do something new. And this is very much one of those commanders, of course, the Calliope. Uh, pretty useful option in that regard. Ihito here, running with Special Operations Doctrine, Fortifications Doctrine, and Luftwaffe Ground Forces Doctrine. Honestly, not three of my favorite OKW commanders. Objectively, fine. Just not the ones that I like very much at the moment. Um, fortifications Doctrine, I'm kind of a little bit confused about. People, I just... What is it actually doing that is changing games for OKW players? I mean... The Pack 43 is okay. And the Left 18 are okay. But I feel like and more the Pack 43 than the Left 18, they're so easy to answer. But even the Left 18 is so fragile of an investment. I just don't really feel like you can rely on them. Not in a 1v1, anyway. And maybe it's just zeroing artillery? I don't know. I feel like you can get commanders who also have really good artillery or munition dumps for OKW, but also have four really good abilities that make you way stronger during the first, like, 30-40 minutes of the game. And this commander is not one of those, so... S Mine Spam. Oh, okay. Volks Mine... Oh, uh, okay. All right, cool. All right, thanks, creative name. And uh, Strelok in chat there with the S Mine Spam is the answer. All right, okay, cool. All right, so... Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Field defenses, of course. Volks Grenadiers can build minefields. Okay. All right, that's a real upgrade. That's cool. I, I get it. I get it. That's cool. Imagine a commander with rifle grenades, mortar half-tracks, priests, calliope, and time on target. Yeah, I'm interested. I'm interested. There's a lot of overlap between three of those units. I think you... I think you probably only want the Mortar Half-Track and the Calliope or the Priest. But apart from that, yeah, I'm super interested. <laughs> Creative name. We didn't say it would be a good commander. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Looks like it's going to be super standard stuff. Actually, no, I take it back. We've got Triple Rifleman and Double Rear Ash here for Sturm Tiger Giap. So this probably an adaptation to the Urban Assault Company. Uh, playstyle that we have here. Um, keep an eye out for the rifle grenades on the rear ash, of course. Um, and uh, looks like it's super standard stuff here for Ihito as well. Going to be triple volks into battle grip attack. Um, so, yep, these two players kind of doing pretty regular stuff here in the first few minutes of this game. But then again, OKW and USF are like, at least for the first five, five or seven minutes or so, they are so solved. Like, you are either doing the standard stuff or you are doing something really out there you know it's not like soviets um or even Wehrmacht, where you have a lot more room for sort of expression and creativity and, and idiosyncrasy with your builds like if you're playing okw you're going to be building volks grenadiers for the first five minutes usually i mean you might throw in a kubel that's like the only option or you're doing something super weird and out there i suppose there's panzer fusilier builds as well but i'm going to level with you i don't think panzer fusiliers are really worth it in the first five minutes of the game like they're just they're just Volks Grenadiers that cost more but are kind of worse. There's that rifle grenade. And uh, that forces a split and a double fallback from these Volks. Could have stayed and traded a moment longer. I feel like you could have gotten at least one of these squads to fall back before you had to get out of there for a Hito. Uh, Captain Tech for the American player. So I I think this, this does qualify as the rare attack. 
I see Captain Tech less often, for sure, uh, than Lieutenant Tech. The AA half-track, though, is very potent, and having access to the M1 AT gun is awesome. So, yep, there we go. And, yep, the flak half-track is going to be the choice for Ahito, American Forces. Going to take control of the middle of the field here. Um, Emma Duranke, yes, I, Panzer Fusiliers do grow to outperform Volks Grenadiers, particularly with Veteran C and especially, of course, with the G43 upgrade, yeah, they do, but I still, I, I think if you're using Panzer Fusiliers, then you kind of want one or two squads of Volks Grenadiers as well, um, that's my opinion, I think that's actually stronger than just having three or four squads of Panzer Fusiliers, and if you're going for like a two and two mix-up combo, I really like getting the Vox Grenadiers first. So I kind of think for the first five minutes of the game, it's like, I still think that you really want get, to get those Vox out first. The enemy is overrunning one of our capture points. So the captain here going to go for a bit of a deep push here into the German side of the map. Gets flushed out by a flak half track and a bunch of angry vol uh, storm pioneers. Meanwhile, American forces. What is with that fallback? Why are we falling back? Those rear ash. That was weird. I think that was an accident, maybe. That seemed like a weird squad to fall back there. Not quite sure what Storm Tiger Giap was thinking there. Rifle grenade comes down. God damn, these rifle grenades are super annoying, aren't they? How much do they cost? Rifle grenade launcher, 60 munitions. Okay. And then do they just fire rifle grenades, kind of like they do from fighting positions? That's like, wow. Uh, Indische Legion. Is it better to micro the flak half-track between models, or is it too much workload, as in attack ground? Uh, it probably is better doing that, yeah. M1 AT gun is here, though. Captain Tech going to make itself felt here. This flak half-track probably still hittable with that, if he attacks grounds here. Uh, okay, he's gonna give way there. All right, so that's really cool. Okay, all right, all right. So uh, to be honest, I mean, because this commander, I've just not cast it very many times. Seeing the rifle grenade launcher on rear ash is still fairly new to me. That is really cool. So you pay 60 munitions, and then they just kind of fire it a little bit, just like a regular weapon. This is not costing munitions on a per rifle grenade basis. That's quite exciting. Nobody else gets a, a u nobody else gets a unit, an infantry unit that does anything like that. Certainly not this early in the game. Certainly not on your engineers. That is really interesting. Okay, creative name of pineapple fruits seem to have the solution that when using the flak half track, the auto target is better unless there's some crazy weird split on the models. Uh, and that that makes sense to me. Yeah, Daten, those rifle grenade launchers do seem, they seem like they'd be amazing. They don't seem to have the best range, so I think you might still have a hard time approaching a machine gun from the front arc, but if you can get anywhere near the machine gun, those rifle grenades seem like a fairly decent counter to weapon teams for sure. And of course, mortars, AT guns, yeah, you're, you're just, you're winning there. Um, and like, the thing is, right, I actually reckon they're really effective against frontline infantry, against Volks grenadiers and stuff like really good because the thing is if your opponent is microing to not get killed by rifle grenades from your rear ash then those volks grenadiers or whatever it is are not shooting at max efficiently e efficiency they're, they're really not contributing very much as long as they're moving and not properly shooting loses the flak half track there um so the value of actually just firing these rifle grenades at your opponent's volks and just like letting the grenades like disrupt your opponent's base of fire probably is actually really good given that these things seem free i mean look how often they're popping out like this is super annoying um so yeah i feel like actually these uh these rifle grenades there is a there is a lot of value in regular fights too uh emma Duranke, the upgrade is new insofar as it came with this commander who was new ish but i mean it's been in the game for a long time now it's just that this commander is very rarely taken so we only seldom get to have a look at this anyway he loses a squad of the rear ash flak half track going to come out here and attempts to oh no but the m1 does get looted by Axis forces. Faust comes down, and the M1 here is going to be used. How do you like that? A taste of your own medicine. Using the M1 against the uh, the AA half track of the American player, but uh, the M1 gets gibbed. Kettenwerfer comes through, delivers the goods. Oh God! 
and Sturm Tiger Giap has seen enough. Losing the flak half track and shortly about to lose these infantry. I'll be honest with you, like I don't actually think that that one was over. Because uh, even with these grenades going off, I'm not sure that those squads would die. Certainly if you press fall back right now, they might not die. And uh, I mean, if you discount the Raketenwerfer, which doesn't really do much anymore after that flak half track is dead, then it's Storm Pioneers, five Volks Grenadiers. I, I, that's a lot. That's a lot. And that, but that's against a captain, three riflemen, and some rear rush with a rifle grenade launcher. Not the end of the world. Like, I don't think you have to leave the game there. Uh, but certainly things do look bad for Storm Tiger Giap. And Storm Tiger Giap, it's their decision. They get to leave the game whenever they like. And that is that is the thing. Was that four Volks? I thought it was five. Yeah, I thought it was five. All right, cool. Oh, yeah, the flak half track is kind of a glass cannon, yeah. But weirdly enough, it's a glass cannon that you can that can also anchor your line. If you can keep it just out of range of your opponent's things that hurt it, it really can be the linchpin of a of a decent lineup. Oh my god. I mean, there's kind of nobody good online. What is going on? Where is everybody? Let me just check. Hang on. Oh yikes. Yeah, there's 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 very little in the way of good players online right now. Mmm. Can I see? Yeah. Um. Well, we've got a crossroads game, Vermax against USF here. Uh, I guess so, Dan. I don't know. I mean, it is Monday. People might actually have work to do. <laughs> uh, we've got an Angerville game between two players. I honestly don't recognise. Kerr one four one is good. All right, pineapple. Cool. Okay. Well, let's load on into this one. My worry about this one is that there is a couple of minutes at the start of this game here. So let's just see how long before this game actually gets underway. And our survey says four minutes, 20. Um, all right, cool. Well, what we're gonna do then, we're just gonna take a quick four minute break. I'll be back at 42 minutes past the hour and we'll hop into this game. I'm gonna grab myself a drink and stretch my legs. Uh, yeah, cool. All right, catch you guys in four minutes.
All right, what is up and a very warm welcome back. The sun is actually now hiding and the magpie is still casting. Coming to you guys with another live one versus one. Company of Heroes 2 game fresh from the top of the ladder featuring a spawning in the south. It will be the Vermact forces of Kerr 141, who I hear has a decent USF. Then we're gonna find out exactly what their Vermact is up to here in a sec. In the north, it'll be Sturm Tiger Giap coming off of the back of a fairly rough loss. Um, so, uh, Yep, those are our two players. Crossroad here, gonna be the map. It's gonna be Urban Assault Company again here for Giap. So I imagine we're probably gonna see a similar opener, um, which contained the double rear ash with fairly rapid rifle grenade upgrades, um, rifle grenade launcher upgrades. Hey, Aki HQ. Good to see you. Uh, the second piece of the commander is the Dozer Blade upgrade for the Shermans. Um, so yeah, it like, equips them with white phosphorus shells and Dozer Blades, apparently. Um, I believe the Dozer Blades like, have a HP and armor advantage, but slow you down as well. So that's what that one's up to. Um, Alright, so pretty standard stuff out of this Vermac player. Curl 1 for 1 running with Mechanized Assault Doctrine, which I honestly think should be on everybody's Vermac roster all the time. It's ridiculous. This commander, I reckon throughout the course of the entire of the history of this game, patch through patch, through better and worse, I actually just think that this has probably been the most besterest Vermac commander. Like, it's just on average throughout the history of the game. Um, we've also got Defensive do Doctrine, which is my favourite of the two Ostrapen Doctrines, because it's the one which gives you the Stug E with the Ostrapen. Um, and I think that's really strong. And German Infantry Doctrine, which, like, everybody loves at the moment, because it's really good. Fair enough. I, I don't really like German Infantry Doctrine. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it does some amazingly powerful things, such as addressing some of the biggest weaknesses of the Vermac faction and also just making Vermac better at the things it does best. And that's awesome. But I don't know. I It's very munitions dependent. So there is a built-in weakness there. If you don't get off, if you don't, if you don't get the munitions income to support German infantry doctrine, you're going to have a bad time. Um, so, you know, that's a weakness. And if you compare that to this defensive doctrine, it's like, well, if you don't get the munitions, then defensive doctrine is still going to kick ass because you're going to have Ostrapen everywhere and then access to Stuggies. So, like, I don't know. Um, there is a weakness there. Um, and I don't know. I guess I just prefer watching games where Vermax are doing more interesting things than veteran squad leaders. I mean, veteran squad leaders are fine. They're cool. But they're not thrilling. And they don't create a lot of tension for viewers and spectators, in my opinion. Um, so, anyway. Big game! What's going on, friend? Uh, <laughs> we actually cast the um, Homeworld Deserts of Karak game first today. So, um, that one has already that one's already happened. Just so you know. Sorry about that. Uh, I thought I'd mix it up a little bit today by putting the Deserts of Karak at the front end of the stream instead. Um... I think Infantry Commander just lacks spice for me. Yeah, that's right. It, it just lacks spice. It just kind of does fairly predictable Vermax stuff. It just makes Vermax better at the things it does best, and it makes some of the worst things about Vermax less bad. And you get Fragmentation Bombing Run, and it's like, okay. Hey, hey, Aki HQ just bought Deserts of Karak. Nice one. Welcome aboard. Definitely make sure you get on the Discord community, um, because... Uh, they will help you immeasurably with everything, and they're a great bunch. And you know, you you can find practice partners and just rock out there. So yeah, do do join the Homeworld Discord community. It's awesome. Would I ever do a video about all the commanders? That is actually a really interesting idea, Primark Pepe. Um, so as these two players sort of get to grips with each other, one, one thing I, I, I'll just talk about something else. One, one thing I've been thinking about recently is I know I'm doing sort of more streaming on Twitch now and that's sort of become my like primary format and then I'm uploading the VODs onto YouTube. But um, in my mind, Twitch and YouTube are actually, of course, very different. Or oh, rifle grenade on the MG42. Uh, actually, that was kind of a miss. Twitch and, um, uh, Twitch and YouTube are actually very different. And of course, they really are best suited to different things. And Whilst Twitch is fantastic for streaming and live stuff and doing live game casting, 
Um, when it comes to YouTube, I think that that's much better for doing like obviously like produced sort of content. Um, and I have been wondering exactly, because I would like to practice my video editing skills and actually have a bash at making some proper good YouTube videos, you know, actually putting, framing some nice stuff together and producing a video. Um, so I've been wondering exactly what to do. Um, and to a certain extent, it's not happened sooner because I just, you know, I still have to do work and I've still got a load of other things I'm doing every week. So I just haven't really had the time to get around to it, but it is like just a question in my mind. So that idea of doing a, a video overview of like my thoughts on the commanders in the game, that's actually a really interesting idea. We could, um, we could do that for sure. Thanks very much for the idea. Nice one. Oh, a game with the links to the discord. Nice one. So we've got a Zwei hundred Zwei and Zwanzig. Zonder, what is it? Zonder, Zonder Kampfwagen, that's it. I, I believe that's what the S, S, SKD bit stands for on it. Um, so yep, 222 Scout car gonna be out here in a moment. Auto cannon blazing. Uh, hang on a second, did he, did he not get any tech? Wow, this is actually some pretty late tech here for the American player. Uh, like relatively late, because we've gone up to quad rifleman. Interesting. Hang on a second. So I know because I was talking about YouTube and Twitch, I did, wasn't actually paying the most attention to those early stages. Okay, so okay, this is actually a slightly different build from Storm Tiger Gap to last game. We've only got the one rear esh company, a uh, rear esh squad, one rear, one um, rifle grenade launcher, but we've gone up to four riflemen. Hmm. Um, seemingly at the expense of delaying our officer tech. This seems odd. 222 gets committed out into West here, just going to be policing some riflemen. The first star of veterancy is still a ways away on these riflemen, so the 222 will be able to bully them around. MG42 on support here, easy pickings for the Axis forces. Uh, while in mid, where the bulk of the American forces are, progress remains good. Going to get American boots onto the central VP. Still no commander pick here from Kerr 141. And that bodes well. I always feel a bit weird when players just pick a commander straight away, because it's like... Unless there's a thing like Radio Intercepts or Ostrop and Call-In, which you really want to be using, like, second one of the game. Uh, it's actually just not very efficient, is it? Like, oh, what? The Sturm Tiger Gap? Oh, that has to be a DC. Oh, uh, no, we got a bug splat here. Oh, man. Oh, well. God, that's a real shame. Sorry, everybody. That is the risk of casting live games from the ladder. You never know what you're going to get. And uh, that spectacular spectrum of possible possibilities uh, also includes the occasional Bugs Black game. He lost his ambulance? Yeah, sure. But I mean, you wouldn't leave a game over that, would you? Ooh, we've got Ihito and Tieflieger on Crossing in the Woods. OKW versus UKF. What do you guys think about that? That could be a good one. Or we've got Vermak vs. Soviets on Orechnaya Prepava. Uh, and that is going to be Kerr 1 for 1 and this one. What do we know about you, this one? Not a lot is the answer. Um, so, all right, what do we fancy between these two? Uh, this one is top 30 as well. All right. Okay. Um, oh, it's a close one between these two games. I might roll a dice. I feel like I actually want to see some UKF. Um, and I really like Crossing in the Woods. And Ahito came off the back of a win recently, so that usually bodes well. Yeah, I'm going to cast the UKF game. All right, this, yeah, Emma Duranke and Datton in chat as well, calling out for the Brit game. <laughs> Annoyingly, though, there's going to be another couple minutes at the start of this one. <sighs> We're just not having the best of luck on the ladder here, finding a decent game today, are we? Well, let's load in and see exactly what the delay will be. Greetings, what is up, and welcome. 28 viewers. That is pretty cool, given that we've only been up less than an hour. And we've 
<laughs> we've not really managed to get our teeth into a Company of Heroes 2 game. Like, we've had... This is a, this will be our third attempt, but we've had two very rapid affairs, probably rage quits or bug splats. Not not really exactly sure which, but yeah. Um, oh, okay, all right. It's going to be another four minute break. I'm afraid there's no no other thing for it. I'm afraid we are in for 240 more seconds of Frank Lepaki's amazing soundtrack, um, and. I mean, there's only so many cups of tea I can make. I might go and like peel myself an apple or something. But I will be back in four minutes. Fingers crossed this game is going to be a banger. We've got Brits. We've got OKW. The map is good. The table, hopefully, is set. So, um, right. I'm going, to, I'm going to take off. I'll be back in three minutes, 40 seconds.
the deal are on the line. Greetings, what is up, and a very warm welcome back to the channel. The sun is hiding and the magpie is casting. You know what? I was wrong. The sun is shining out there. It's doing something. Um, anyway, we're going to be casting this game on Crossing in the Woods, featuring spawning in the north, it is going to be the OKW forces of Ihito. And spawning in the south, it is going to be the UKF forces of Typhliger. Um, so, um, everything, or indeed... Definitely something to play for here, even if it is just ladder points and a bit of pride. Two RTS Meisters going to be facing off against each other for our entertainment. Little do they know, there's a bunch of people watching them on the internet. Um, Datton, you want to see the Storm Pioneer bulletin? Storm Pioneers build all defensive structures 10% faster. Uh, we've also got a Panzer Fusilier one there. Panzer Fusilier weapons cool down 2% faster. Uh, interesting. And it's just tom to Tommy damage for uh, Typhliger. It's kind of lame, but it could make a bit of difference if you're frantically throwing down a Pack 43 and there's an enemy tank sort of rampaging towards you. Um, it's pronounced more like Tiflager. Oh. Is it is that is that is that because it's German? Interesting. Oh, it is German. Tefleger. Okay, fair enough. There we go. Um. So okay, yeah, it looks like some pretty standard stuff. Yeah, extra Faust range is like pretty pretty good actually that actually will change games because there's going to be times you get a faust off where you wouldn't have without it and fausts are massive so yeah um so okay yeah we got the vickers gun going to be backing up three squads of tommies we got the schwervermack schlepper coming out so we're going to know what's going on with those guys um and i'll tell you what because the, i mean this is a super standard opening we're not seeing kubel spam we're not seeing like I don't know, universal carrier spam or like something crazy going on in the first few minutes of this game. So I'm going to just talk about something uh, um, whilst this game gets underway. Um, what, what tech are we having here? It is going to be Battle Gripper HQ tech. Um, and that is, I'm going to talk about Titanfall 2 because it's great. Um, so in 2016, um, now, who, who develops Titanfall 2? Oh, man, I, I think they're called Reload. I actually can't remember off the top of my head. But anyway, in 2016, Titanfall 2 came out, and I got it, like, straight away. And it was, at the time, I just remember thinking, this might be the best FPS I've ever played, which is saying a lot, because some certain FPSs are super dear to my heart in a borderline spiritual way, which might sound like a weird thing to say, but I guess I'm a weirdo. Um... So yeah, I played I played Titanfall and for like two months probably after it came out, I like religiously played it and I got pretty good at it and I had a great time and it was just amazing. Um, but um, for whatever reason, I drifted away from Titanfall 2 and then I actually did a little bit of research and it turns out that actually Titanfall 2 kind of got thrown under the bus um, because... Um, so the publisher is EA, and EA are like absolutely, absolutely horrible, like at everything they do, pretty much. And they are kind of terrible, and they are sort of one of the biggest villains in video gaming. They're like one of the baddies. Um, so they had this fantastic design studio who made, and I'm not exaggerating here, one of the best games of all time. And then they downplayed the marketing because they had other releases. EA had other releases. And producers get to do a lot of the marketing. And producers get probably the biggest say in what the release date for a video game is. And EA threw Titanfall 2 under the bus by sandwiching it. Um, so a week before Titanfall 2 came out, the new Battlefield game came out. And I think four weeks after, or three weeks after Titanfall 2 came out, the new Call of Duty Modern Warfare game, out, game came out. 
And Titanfall 2 is a game that actually, really, the player base is competing with those games. It is an FPS. It's a really cool modern FPS, just like Modern Warfare and um, Battlefield. So, like, yeah, that was really bad. And because they were releasing it within a week of Battlefield, they actually focused the majority of their marketing behind the Battlefield franchise for various reasons that actually make a lot of sense. I mean, Titanfall is a more niche game because it's in a sci-fi setting and Battlefield has a massive established fan base and is a really big deal in the world of gaming. And that makes sense. You've got to prioritize these things. But, um, I mean, EA, like, I mean, they fucked it, didn't they? They, they? they, I mean, if you don't give a game any marketing and you release it between two much bigger releases, it's going to be fucked. So, yeah, Titanfall 2 kind of... Kind of got thrown under the bus um, in a way that was so unfair to the developers because they had produced a fantastic, like one of the best games of all time. It, it was amazing. Skip forward to around about now. So Titanfall 2 has just recently released on Steam. I don't know how the developers have been able to hook up this deal, but finally it's happening. And the player base, the pe play, player base has exploded. Absolutely exploded. Because the other thing about EA is they make you use Origin which literally is spyware. It's like aggressive malware. Um, it's horrible. And as if that weren't bad enough, it's actually really bad at its job. Like it's actually very difficult to get it to just do normal things like organize your game library or allow you to access your games in any way that makes sense or is usable or fun. So like Origin is horrible. It was actually banned by like the German government. Like they, they said that you're not allowed to release this in Germany because it is aggressive spyware and you're misleading consumers. So EA had to change how it works in some regards to let it to let it come out in the EU and Germany. Um, so yeah, T Titanfall was also forced onto this god awful launcher origin. Um, so anyway, at the end of all this, basically what I'm saying is, is t take two things away from this. One, EA are muck terrible and you should, if you can, do everything you can to sabotage their future success and deny them any money because they are awful. They are, they are so bad for video gaming. And two, Titanfall 2 is out on Steam. You can buy it right now in the Steam sale for like not a lot of money. It's like eight pounds, I think, something like that. And honestly, I can't think of a better use of money for eight pounds. There is nothing you can do with eight pounds that will bring you more enjoyment than Titanfall. I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, so yeah, Titanfall 2 is out on Steam, the player base has exploded, and the developers are finally seeing some money for this epic game that they made. So like, I just thought I'd put it out, I just thought I'd let everyone know this is just a little crusade I'm on in video gaming. Titanfall is goddamn amazing, and it is one of the biggest travesties of the last decade in video gaming that the developers who made such an amazing game got so monumentally screwed and did not get to reap the rewards for doing so. I mean... That made me so angry. So there we go. Yeah, I mean, Datton in chat making a great point. Even if you don't care about the PvP multiplayer, the campaign on Titanfall is one of the best FPS experiences you'll ever have. It's just it's phenomenal. Um, and the funny thing is, now that all my friends have gotten back into it, and I've, got, I've gotten back into it, because we've been playing it this last week or two since it came out on Steam, like, it still feels like, even now in 2020, four years after it came out, because it came out in 2016, it still feels like a super modern, cutting edge FPS with so many innovative gameplay ideas that is so well constructed and so well produced and stitched together. It's, it's just a joy. It feels like a brand new game. If they released it this year in 2020 and charged everyone 50 pounds for it, it would still hold up. Like it's, it's that good. So um, anyway, all right. I feel, I, feel like, I feel like I've done that rant now. I've, 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 we can wrap that one up. But I just wanted everyone to know EA are bastards, and Titanfall 2 is amazing, and you can play it now on Steam. Uh, you still have to download Origin to run it, um, but Steam, you can have it on Steam, you can use it with Steam, you can do all the Steamy stuff with it, and that way the developers actually will get some money for making this amazing game, and hopefully be able to go on to develop another amazing game, dot dot dot, Titanfall 3. Um, so anyway... Um, so we've got Battle Grip at HQ Tech and Schwerpanzer HQ just now deploying. Flak Half Track has been on the field for a little while now. Uh, the American player uh, has been trying to push forward but has been suffering for victory point control and kind of getting, sorry, American, the UKF player, suffering for victory point control here and kind of getting shoved around a little bit. Now there is an AEC out and that's gonna really, well it's gonna do more than check the Flak Half Track. It's actually gonna take it out. Cat and here and a Faust will connect onto the AEC which means it is crippled but unlikely to be destroyed. 
the Raketenwerf are just too far away to put together a KO blow on the uh, on the British scout car here. So, uh, yeah, oh, Respawn, they're called Respawn. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I, for some reason, I just, like, couldn't remember the name of the people who developed Titanfall 2 for that entire rant. Respawn. That's it. Um... Sorry, I'm just reading through chat. Some interesting stuff there. Um, yeah, Brits did need that pick-off. And it's okay for the UKF roster to look a bit small for a couple of reasons. One, you're playing against OKW. Their roster is never too big either. Uh, and two, UKF units tend to just do really well the longer they survive because you start getting the five-man Tommy upgrade. You start getting weapon, upgrade, uh, weapon rack upgrades. Like, they do just scale really well. And the AEC can go on to kind of become, like, a Puma-esque unit. Like, in my opinion, it's not as good as the Puma um, in the later stages with veterancy. The Puma becomes something really quite fearsome in the later stages of the game with veterancy. But the AEC is still, like, in that ilk. It is still useful. It is still powerful, even against medium tanks later on in the game, if you if you can look after it and bed it up. So, um Things right now looking fine here for Typhlyga, except for the victory point situation. Back under the triple cap, hemorrhaging victory points. We will have given away about 150 victory points in just a few seconds here. And on crossing in the woods, that is a very uncomfortable place to be. Um, so the tread shot is bonkers at that one. Is that so creative name? Fair enough. Okay. Let's just take a look at that ability here. Tread shot. Da, 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 targets to, to temporarily slow the target for 30 munitions. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool having a little temporary Faust on your AEC there. <gasps> Pardon me, that's very useful, I'll grant you. But doesn't the Puma also get the stun shot, like the aim shot? Um, and the Puma also just has better rate of fire, accuracy, and penetration, which are like the things that you're looking for if you're going to be transitioning your sort of early, early scout vehicle into a sort of light tank hunter in the late game. Am I... I don't think I'm wrong for that. Vet 2 includes, among other things, minus 30% received accuracy. That does seem good for a vehicle. Damn, good knowledge, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so, okay, combat going on across the map right now. AEC going to be getting stuck into these Storm Pioneers. Vickers gun as well. Meanwhile, there's a scuffle for the fuel point over here in the east of the map. And these Tommies will have to yield. This is too many Volks Grenadiers. Nice infiltration grenade package that was. So Special Forces, uh, Special Operations Doctrine, sorry, is going to be the pick here for Ihito. And uh, we're going to see uh, probably a lot of devastating grenade barrages coming down off of these Volks Grenadiers. Infiltration grenade package is like quietly probably... Maybe the best commander-related grenade upgrade in the game. Because it's so good. You get a full barrage of very dangerous grenades for 20 munitions. And to recharge, they just have to be out of combat for a while. Which, to be honest, most infantry units from time to time in Company of Heroes 2 just naturally are. Because you either fall them back or they're sent off to capture some point somewhere on the map where there's no fighting. And that infiltration grenade package will cycle and become available again. So 20 munitions is actually not a lot to, to pay to throw such a dangerous sort of volley of grenades at someone. Um, five STGs in five minutes. Good spot as well, Dan. Yeah, these Volks Grenadiers pretty well equipped. Brain guns appearing on these Tommies, though. So there's going to be a real sort of um, attacker-defender dynamic when it comes down to the tactics in these fights. The Tommies wanting to stay still and use the Bren guns a little bit more than the Volks Grenadiers, who will be wanting to approach with the more sort of close mid-range oriented STGs, which are also, of course, better at firing on the move than the Bren gun. So um, that's kind of going to be the infantry dynamic we see moving forwards here, and it's going to come down to whether the British player can take fights from cover with nice overlapping fields of fire, possibly with the support of the Vickers gun here, to to get the better end of the DPS war against these Axis units. And um, this AEC finally getting its first star of veterancy as well, continuing to be pretty useful even against this infantry, so that's quite nice to have. Boys from Wales, of course, present and correct, the metal detector on them. But um, still bleeding out here. we are lost 204 tickets so far. This is looking a little bleak in terms of the scoreline for the UKF player. Still plenty of time in this game. These fortunes can indeed reverse, but this is looking. This is this is this is this is caution now required for sure for Typhlyger, who I'm going to continue to mispronounce their name because <laughs> when I look down here, that's just how I see it. It's Typhlyger because even because I'm not not German, but I I know that I am basically saying it wrong now. Thanks guys. Um, so Obersoldaten are going to be uh, coming on out of the Schwerpanzer HQ. 
And Oversoul done with five squads of Volks with STGs. Now I'm starting to feel a bit worried. Now it's going to be a little difficult once those Oversoul Darton come out for um, TIE Flyger to reliably take infantry fights. So this is going to be a problem. Does have the Vickers gun, which will be very helpful. Uh, to be honest, I think when you see the second squad of Oversoul... Sorry, when you see the um, Oversoul Darton, I reckon it's maybe worth thinking about going for that second Vickers gun. Crossing on the Woods is just a map where I always like to have two machine guns because it's wide enough at the middle and there's enough open ground where I just feel like a machine gun is just kind of always going to be really useful um, and I normally want one on each side of the map uh, when I play this when I play this one so I feel like it, it would be a good idea to think about going for that uh, oh I was about to go and check the tech I was, about, I was, I was thinking my company commands post sensors were tingling well there's the announcement the company command post is now finished tie flyger with what 60 fuel in the bank the way the income has been looking, it's probably going to be two, three minutes before we see a choice taken from that company command tech. Uh, looks like that means Ihito here, who has got Panzer authorization complete, is going to have possibly even a command panther, actually. That does cost 200 fuel and require another one and a half com command points, but we're pretty close, actually, to where command panther could be the first vehicle out here for the uh, OKW player. And that is a world of hurt for the UKF player. A Command Panther is serious business. And a couple of QF six pounders, even with the AEC, that, that Command Panther is a slippery beast. You'll be lucky to get to grips with it with those weapons. Um, it's just fast and it's armored enough that as long as the OKW player doesn't commit a mistake, that Command Panther ought to be able to level up and provide just an insane value. It really is one of those units where the longer it survives, the more value it provides. And it synergizes so well with all the other stuff that OKW is doing. Um, that if you get it out, if you get the Command Panther on the battlefield at the sub 20 minute mark and it goes on to not die, that's a real problem. Um, it's just not very easy to bring that one to bring that one down. So I reckon, I mean, it looks to me like a Hito is saving for that. We are seeing a ton of fuel saving. We're not seeing the Mechanized Regiment HQ come down, which would announce some intention to go for the uh, King Tiger. Um, and let's be real, you don't go for Special Operations Doctrine, the only commander who gets the Command Panther, uh, without without being interested in getting that unit, right? So I'm hoping we're going to have a Command Panther game here. Now, it looks like TIE Flyger, kind of taking a page out of Caesar's book here, going to be going for the sort of 17 and 18 minute mark UKF sniper, getting the boys 55 cal uh, sniper out here to help deal with what is becoming an increasingly bleak situation. Let's just quickly crack the tack and you can get a feel for just how concentrated the UKF position is. Surrounded right now by a concave of Axis units who are cycling back and forth from the base very efficiently. Notice we've got the Vampire Scope equipped uh, Obersol Darton who are gonna be DPS powerhouses coming on in here to reap efficiency against these UKF units. Now, Bren guns are blazing, Axis units are having a high turnover rate here on the front C -c 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 command panther um but yeah this situation is looking super bad now the ukf players fuel income is so low i mean when you see a command panther that is one of the few times where an actual firefly is a reasonable proposition because you can get it out for less fuel than a comet you don't have to research the hammer tech and it will help keep a command panther on notice um but Oh god, this is going to be tough. Okay, finding some damage immediately on the uh, with the QF six pounder is fine, but I mean, look at look at that, look at how much damage a QF six pounder round does to a command panther. Like the command panther is blissfully unconcerned for now, anyway. And remember, uh, once this command panther, or if it makes it to two stars of veterancy, it does get those armored skirts, which makes it even more difficult to bring down. So. What's special about the Command Panther versus the regular Panther? Well, Dan, I'm glad you asked. Let's take a look at the Command Panther here. Uh, so uh, we get you get the Blitz, which is normal. You get coordinated fire, 35 munitions. Uh, the Panther coordinates nearby units to improve accuracy against a single target. It also has a command aura, like a command radius, right? Uh, it, it, which improves the movement and sight of vehicles. Uh, I thought it had another radius that buffs infantry. I'm wrong about that. It doesn't. Okay, I'm thinking of the Command Panther for- Oh my god! Ah! Oh! What the- What? Oh my god, those six pounders rinsed the Command Panther. Oh man. Oh, I really thought we were going to get a decent Command Panther game there. That You cannot ask for a better start in life than getting your Command Panther out before 20 minutes. I mean, uh... At Vet 5 it buffs infantry. Okay, Pineapple Fruit, thanks. Um, oh, 
Well, um, don't worry about it then, boys. The Command Panther not going to be that big of a factor in this game. But, I mean, l look how good the resource control has been for Ihito. That having having lost a Command Panther within a couple of minutes here, plus 39, that is the rate of fuel income for this OKW monster right now. Um, and if the British player doesn't die in terms of the scoreline, then, then, then this game may go on long enough for a... No, it's not going to be a second Command Panther. It's just going to be a Panzer IV. Fair enough. That's fine as well. Um, I think Ahito recognizing here that the correct line of play is probably just to try and end the game. Um, and the, the Panzer IV comes out quicker and is actually better against infantry in the short term. So is the better choice if you want to win the game over the course of the next couple of minutes. And that definitely looks like the line to go for. Um, it's worse when vetted compared to a normal panther but what makes it better is the buff that it gives to all units when it has vet 5 okay interesting Masilla Seca also welcome aboard friend I'm not sure I've seen you in chat before um, that's the thing if you want to get Okay, well, AC gets hung out to dry here. Unfortunately, the engine busted by Faust. Rakettenworth are firing in here. Things looking pretty bleak for the UKF player. Cromwell on the build queue. Panzer IV headed to the front. So it looks like we're going to have a medium tank showdown in the, what could be the closing moments of this game. Heroic Tommies will be able to capture the Eastern VP here. And that means that uh, TIE Flyger buys himself a, a small extension in this game. But we need more. And the OKW forces are dug in right now on this uh, on this command point. Oh, sorry, on this cutoff point. Now the Vickers gun is going to be nice here for driving those away. Panzer IV though gets the best. Oh no! What is this Cromwell doing? Oh no! Okay, well, the Panzer IV gets a really good opening engage there onto the uh, Cromwell, finding two penetrating hits almost for free. Gets donked, I suppose, by a, a six-pounder AT gun. But those AT guns are getting torn apart by five-star Volks with STGs. That's a dead Cromwell now. The UKF sniper will not be uh, uh, able to will not be able to save the UKF medium, and things looking bleak as the sniper goes down, the Cromwell goes down, and I mean the OKF player, sorry the OK OKF OKW player has lost one squad of Volks Grenadiers over that last phase of play somewhere, I think, but like the Panzer IV is rampant, yeah, it is tearing through the countryside. Ah, oh, brave Tommy's attempt to recrew the uh, six pounder, but just in the nick of time, infrared Ubers come around the corner and just rinse the crew off of that weapon team. And now, uh, I just there's nothing. It's a heroic last stand here from Typhlyger, but I, I don't feel good about the chances here. Wow, a little bit of an overextension there from Mojito, blundering into the uh, the arc of the base defense here, the Vickers K bunker. Getting some good suppress here and forcing back a number of units. Actually, the Panzer IV gets taken out. How the hell did he manage to lose that? I am actually not sure how he managed to lose that to one six-pounder gun. Um, hmm. Did anyone see, actually, if something else happened to that uh, to that, that Panzer? Because I feel like Ahito just kind of fell asleep on the micro there. Like, that seems strange. I mean, I guess Ahito doesn't care, but this game is technically not over. The UKF player is actually not bleeding right now. And this UKF army, yeah, it's small. It's not as good as the German army, but this is not 100% a win for Ahito now. I think with the Panzer IV, this game is very difficult for the UKF player. But now it actually seems kind of possible. I mean, the UKF player actually, I mean, they're not connected, but the UKF player is at least denying double fuel. Man, look how expertly Ahito has just been digging in on this cutoff there. That's so frustrating for the uh, for the UKF player. Vickers gun coming forwards here, but it's actually there are just Volks in its blind quarter here. Gonna get deployed, but oh, the infiltration grenade package so good. That should oh, the infiltration grenade package is actually very good. Gets a kill on a Volks grenadier squad though, so that's nice. Um, he gardened up. <laughs> Yeah, he gardened up for show. All right, you know, Tommies are going to reconnect the cutoff. Axis forces are going to reposition for a push into west, into east. Sorry, but any any forces that are pushing east are not coming in to clobber Tie Flyger in the base and go for the cutoff. So that is actually some pressure off of the UKF player for now. Not for long, because these forces are going to come crashing back in in a second. But for now, this is a reprieve. Um, and. 
Okay, now this is this is what matters most though. The, the Kattenwerfer actually is going to cut. Oh, where is he going? Oh, yeah, he's going to stop there. So the Kattenwerfer is actually going to decap this point, and there are actually no UKF points near victory points on the map. So I feel like uh, Ihito is actually taking care of business here. But somehow, I mean, if you actually just look at the armies, like Typhlyger has has brought back the army war. You know, these these two armies basically are essentially evenly matched now. So it's just the scoreline which kind of makes this game. An almost unwinnable proposition for Tie Flyger. Um, UK forces will get to mid. I feel like what's going to happen is going to he's going to stabilise with like a handful of tickets, like like ninety or less, and then there's just not going to be enough UK forces to play out the rest of the game without with just ninety tickets left. I just I just don't think it's going to be doable, but we'll see. I could be wrong. I'm probably not though. Yeah, if if yeah, uh, yeah, if if he'd have had both VPs for that phase of play for sure, I agree, Dan. And a bit of a lag spike there, but we 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 we've even managed to get both of the um, QF six pounders back up again as well for Typhlyger. So I I almost like this army. <laughs> 216 munitions. I, I'm sure we could afford a couple more Tommy guns. Or is this... Oh, sorry, Bren guns on these Tommies. Or is that a conscious decision... <coughs> pardon me. Is that a conscious decision not to put the Tommy... Not to put Bren guns on all these squads? Oh, God. He just lost the Obers. Yeah. Okay. Well. He is kind of throwing a bit. Yeah. But he's going to have another Command Panther if he wants it. Did he complete the tech tree? No. Going to have another Command Panther if he wants it. And I'll tell you what. If you could, if you could, um, if you could um, take over a position as an OKW player where you're leading 430 tickets over 81 and you have three Volks plus Storm Pioneer plus Rakettenwerfer plus Command Panther versus Quad Tommy, Double AT Gun, Vickers, you would, you would take that position in a flash. That is a great position to be playing from. So... Uh, I even think, despite Ihito having thrown considerable amounts of resources here, uh, if he just goes for the Command Panther, why are we stacking, stacking this much manpower? Command Panther is not this much manpower. We could get out another squad, and we do desperately need it. Rebuild the Obersold Art, mate. Um, but yeah. Yeah, or, or, or a mortar, actually. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Light gun, actually. That, that would be absolutely feasible here. I actually think light guns are pretty good on crossing in the wood as well. So, okay. Command Panther number two comes out about ten minutes after its predecessor. And my god, what a ten minutes that was. Um, why doesn't he just hot pick a commander and use those munitions? Uh, I don't know. Good question. All right, so the Command Panther will make its presence felt in West here. And remember, there are still two six-pounder AT guns here, and that was enough to deal with the last, the last Command Panther. We got to, oh, I can see immediately he's hemorrhaging shots. I'm not, not super digging the, the, the vehicle management, if I'm honest, from Ahito. It has not looked strong this game, but he's still just hemorrhaging shots to this, to this, to these six-pounders. It's it's okay if you want to use the command panther here, you can. It's fine to use the. What are we doing? Okay, Nihito. All right, we need to go back to school and learn how to micro tanks, my friend, because this is looking so bad. What are we doing? You're still taking shots here, man. Oh my god. <laughs> he rage quits. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I mean, part of me feels a bit bad for Ahito that we caught this game on the ladder and that, that and literally that I was casting it live to 26 strangers over the internet and we'll be uploading it to YouTube. I do feel a bit bad for him because uh, even now, even now with the demise of that Command Panther, at 418 tickets over 71, this is actually a fine position for OKW. It really is. So... Um, you think that looks like a disconnect? What, like immediately after the Command Panther dies, creative name? I don't know. I feel like... Well, anyway, what I was going to say, what I was going to say, right, was you're, you're the OKW player. You have this Command Panther and you want to use the Command Panther to police some uh, British infantry away from this position here that I'm boxing, okay? That's fine. You can do that. But you know 
that your opponent will have anti-tank guns somewhere in Fog of War in this area of the map. And as soon as your command panther reveals itself, those anti-tank guns will be turning to face your panther and moving towards it, right? Which means they're going to be coming out of Fog of War somewhere along this line, right? And fi firing shots at you. So you can still use the command panther to police this infantry with its machine guns if instead of driving it in an arc like this and taking a whole load of shots and then losing the command panther which is what happened if instead you drive it around here like this and take shots from here you can just shoot these guys all day and then when the at guns reveal themselves you can just reposition and then reposition and then so what i'm saying is there is a way to use the command panther here where it is not getting shot up by at guns to do the exact same job and like I said earlier, it just kind of feels like a Hito just might need to tighten up the vehicle control a little bit. That's clearly an area to work on. I mean, it seems obvious to say on the back of watching that one game, but yeah, clearly that's just a skill that could use a little bit of work there from a Hito. Yeah, Masilla Seca, you've got to play the Command Panther really cautious. But here's the thing, you've got to play... Honestly, I think you have to play any panther really cautious. The panther tank is actually not a tank that gains very much from driving too close to enemy units at all. Panzer IV is, uh, because the penetration is much better at close range, and that matters on the Panzer IV. And also the machine guns on the Panzer IV are actually really good. So bringing them close to enemy infantry is really good. The panther tanks, like the machine guns are actually not very good. And the gun is actually much, much more okay at like mid and long range. So unless there's a very good reason, like you want to get the drop on an opponent's armored unit, or there's an SU-85 that you're trying to flank, like unless there's something that's like strongly suggesting that you want to be riding in and doing something with the panther, the best way to use a panther is to make use of its core strengths, which are high armor, good HP, and fast speed. And if you just keep it elusive, keep it moving, keep it transitioning, make your opponent not know where the next shot is coming from, that's how to use a panther in my opinion. From your experience, Ihito isn't the kind of player who would rage quit with so little VPs left for his opponent. Ah, oh, fair enough, creative name. Well, that's some good knowledge that you actually have of that specific player, which um, means that, I mean, yeah, probably then that wasn't a rage quit. I'm prepared to accept that. Um, so, okay, having a look at the games, man, there are not that many good players on the ladder today, but uh, we'll cast one more game today, I think, for sure. Um, so let's have a look and see what we got here. We've got um, Sweet Chino and Kasim. I think I've cast a game from Kasim before. Um... And, you know, I think I am actually going to take a punt on that one. Because we've got another Ahito game here, but it's like eight minutes away. And I just want to cast some UKF First Vermax on Langriskaya, so that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I mean, the other great thing about using the Panther at long range is, and if you keep its front armor facing, as Masilla Seca is suggesting... Um, is that actually there aren't that many units that like can reliably deal with the front armor of a panther at, at longer ranges um, whereas the panther usually can make can find good hits with its gun at those ranges so um, yeah I just feel like it is the the the, cluster, the constellation of attributes on a panther tank sort of make it uniquely suited to trying to take fights at longer range most of the time and skirting around your opponent's vision and stuff like that um And then, if you know, when it gets to Vet 1, then it even has the sort of kind of get-out-of-jail card that is Blitz. Like, it's so good. Um, so anyway, spawning in the south here is the United Kingdom forces. It is going to be Sweet Chino. And spawning in the north as the Vermax. It's going to be Kasim Gaju. Um, so it's going to be another Langrisky game here for us. Hopefully a little bit longer and better than our last Langrisky game, but we will see. Yeah, that, that that sounds right to me, Masilla. The uh um the the Panther does feel like it has more range. I mean I've never actually looked at the numbers, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it does have more range than the Tiger one. That does sound right to me. Once it has VET 2, I'm sure its armor is not that far away from Tiger 1 armor as well, right? Does it even Yeah. Yeah, okay, I thought it was close. 
Two hundred and eighty six armor. So that I, I'm guessing that's on the vet two panther versus the tiger at three hundred. Nice. Yeah, and when you take into account how maneuverable the panther is, the fact that it has nearly tiger armor and like a pretty good HP pool. I mean, it's not heavy tank HP pool, but it's like pretty good. Like, it does sort of amaze me how a lot of German players I cast who are really good actually never really seem to get that much value out of the Panther. And I mean, perhaps it's just because it's a unit which I myself am particularly confident with because for a long time, I'm talking like maybe 18 months, I used to play pretty much just OKW. And unless there was something happening in the game that made me want to do something else, my default game plan was always go for the fastest Panther I can and then micro that panther and babysit it and keep it alive and wear my opponent down over time until they just cannot deal with the amount of value that I've been able to get with my OKW army built around a panther. So I have spent a lot of time thinking about and, and microing panthers. So... Looks like it's going to be a tactical support regiment pick here for our UKF player. Uh, so that is actually the guy who gives UKF the mortar squad, which on this map is probably going to be quite useful. Um, so that's an interesting choice. Uh, Kasim here rocking with um, its uh, mechanized assault doctrine, uh, elite troops doctrine, and German geezer with pipe. Hmm. Don't recognize you, mate. Assault support doctrine. Hmm, there we go. Uh, gives you access to Artillery Field Officer, the Opal Blitz cargo truck. Much maligned in the first couple of months of this game. Uh, the Strafing Run, the Fragmentation Bomb, and the Tiger Tank. All of those abilities look fun and useful. Um, the cargo truck on this map, probably not super great. But to be honest, actually, we do often see uh, the cargo truck used on like this point, or I think it, I think it's this point, right? Uh, and it's actually reasonably difficult for your opponent to get to grips with it there. Um, so, yeah. It is it is really heavy on the um, munitions commander. Yeah. Your base can now produce armored cars. Oh, you don't think the you don't think the cargo truck is ever bad? Fair enough. I don't actually know how much it costs to build. I think it used to be like two hundred manpower back in the day. Mm. And for that price, yeah, sure. That, that that actually does seem good. It still costs 200 manpower. Cool. Well, I mean, any time that you can spend 200 manpower to get fuel or munitions, especially in the earlier stages of the game, that is a cool investment. Um, and again, as long as you remember where your truck is and don't fall asleep on, like, just backing it out of harm's way if your opponent ever sort of pushes it out of its out of its home on the map. Uh, it's actually a pretty like slippery and annoying unit to get to grips with. So yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Yeah, Emma Duranke, I, I feel like it is forgotten about a bit. Yeah, um, but also in a sense, I feel like the the Opal resource truck kind of. People think of it as more of a 2v2 and more multiplayer, pardon me, unit. And, and it, 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 does, it does really flourish on those huge maps when you've even got more units from your allies to hide it behind. Um, it can be really strong there. So, but, but that's not to say it's not good in 1v1. I think it is good in 1v1. Damned enemies trying to take a point from us. In this situation, it would be bad, you think? Mm, I think it's too early to say it'd be bad. You can still buy it, like, at 10 minutes and it's okay. Yeah, there's a lot of Tommies out, but wait wait until you've got double MG42. We've only just now had the double MG42 get nicely set up on the map, and that is the kind of wall for Vermax. That is the sort of... The defensive bulwark against the allied terror, if you like. Um, and once you get that double MG, once you get maybe even by a 222 if you really want to make sure that no one's going to slip by, but like, Langrisky is such a small map that you even don't really need the 222. Like, 
you are going to know, if you control this area here, you are going to know if any allied units ever are going to get to here, and then you can just pull the truck away. Um, so I feel like we've got a UKF mortar squad. Yeah. Securing our territory. Oh wow, you get a six pounder with this one as well? Oh my god. That's a pretty cool ability. And you also get like medical supplies. Okay. Well, yeah, medical supplies not really what UKF players because UKF players just normally have Tommies with medical supplies anyway, so they're not usually in the market for that so much. Um was it Elite Troops Doctrine? I think it was Elite Troops Doctrine. Do you remember? Do you guys remember a long time ago now when Elite Troops Doctrine could call in body armor crates? So you could call in these crates and then you could like grab body armor with like a couple of grenadier squads and your like sniper or something, and you could have a sniper with body armor. Man, that that was so cool. I remember those days. So uh, anyway, Axis units here getting pretty aggro. LMG42 going to be piping up the damage on a couple of these Grenadier squads as well. And it will be a 2-2-2. <laughs> Dat and you remember. Okay, nice. I'm glad someone does. Yeah, that was hilarious. Being able to put body armor on like whatever Axis infantry units you felt like. Hang on now. Tommy's, oh, they're forced back by the 2-2-2. Covering the retreat of this one Grenadier. And that is nice. The UKF Mortar already beginning to zero in on some of these uh, Axis weapon teams, though. And look how the dynamic changes when Tommy's, uh, when when UKF actually have access to a unit, which really, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep saying it. All factions should have access to an indirect fire infantry squad weapon team of some variety that can put down smoke as well as HE. I think that that should be a minimum requirement of every faction in the game. Um, and it is nice to see the UKF here doing mortar things for a change. Uh, gives them something that can actually reach out and touch the um, otherwise fairly implacable uh, like Vermax sort of composition. Uh, so going to be an AEC here as well. This 222 looking to work down the QF 6 pounder is a little bit annoying. Uh, but the AEC should come out in time to ward it away before the before the 222 can get the kill on that piece of equipment. Tommy's actually, uh, we don't have to pick this up now. Okay, cool. Uh, for a second there, I thought he was feeling pressured to come out and pick up the, the gun with the Tommies, and that would have been a weird time to do it because he was under fire. Um, but, yep, here comes the AEC. Going to be able to push back the, uh, the 222 for now. Is this going to be an incendiary ammo use, perhaps? No, not an incendiary ammo use. Saving the munitions for now. That was a potential time for an incendiary ammo use because we knew that the uh, AEC was chasing the 222. There would have actually been enough time to preemptively load the incendiary ammo there onto that machine gun and get uh, get some good damage on the AEC and possibly hold off the subsequent wave. But uh, opting not to do that, and that's fine as well. Um, so we've got the special Royal Engineer Recovery Squad and they're going to be royally recovering this QF6 pounder here. Um... The two-man sniper team must have been so cool to use. Uh, uh. Mate, it was... <laughs> for, the, for like the first two years that the game was out, like I was just a Vermacht only player. So in my, my experience of the two-man scout sniper teams was like there was nothing cool about that experience. Like nothing. They were, they were just absolute agony to play against. <laughs> Especially as someone who really likes using the Vermax sniper, man. Those scout sniper squads with two members. That was stupid. Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> I, uh, I'm glad that they made that change. Let's put it that way. So, alright. Um, looks like Langriskaya is kind of stabilizing. Langriskaya, because it's so small and because fighting in the middle, it's quite difficult to... It's really difficult to hold a triple cap on this map because the victory points are so close, right? If I turn the camera, you can see all three of the victory points, like one there, one there, one there, and there's not many maps where they are this close to each other. So uh, it's quite hard to put on a triple cap, often anyway, on Langriskaya. Um, and despite the fact that the Vermac player was pushed back into their base in the early stages of this game, and then despite the fact that the UKF player had to deal with a blockade of Axis units holding this area of the map for a minute or two, uh, we actually come out into the beginnings of a mid-game where there's like a, what, a 40 ticket difference between these two players and I actually feel like the compositions are absolutely fine. Nobody is wildly the underdog or like, you know, it's, uh, nobody's 
Nobody's the both aren't both players are like at a similar power level here. I actually like the UKF players composition a bit better. The AEC is really nice to have. The indirect fire option here is doing a good amount of work against these MGs. Uh, it also can be helpful against the pack gun and stuff. Um, but you know the Axis player actually has double LMG 42, so that's a good source of, of punch. And the Panzer Grenadiers are actually out with Shreks on. Okay, so that's unusual to say the least they they these, these were dedicated shrekers the shrek came to, the shreks came out like straight away so this was kasim's intention with these panzer grenadiers and yeah that with the pack gun means that this aec does have to be kind of careful here moving forwards imagine how cool it would be if the brit player has some sort of partisan option Woof. Woo. 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 I, I don't even want to imagine what that commander would be like uh I don't know. I mean, remember the Brit player can already spawn commandos out of some structures and bring in gliders with commandos. Uh, I know that that's not the same as partisans, like, at all, but, like, the, the UKF players have some options for a little bit of surprise tactics. I mean, a UKF partisan commander would be sick, though. I would love that. A commander with French partisan options, like the run-up to D-Day, yeah, because let's not forget, I mean, the French resistance was, like, largely coordinated and supplied by super cunning UKF efforts, right? I mean, we were running airplanes over that channel like a freaking freight delivery service every day and night. <laughs> like, Well, okay, not every day, but definitely every night. Uh, you know, supplying those French resistance with radios and plans and C4. Well, not C4, but, you know, explosives. Of course not C4. Um, okay, incendiary ammo doing some work on this AEC here. Oh, uh, by the way, and I don't want it to sound like I'm trying to give, like, Britain or England credit for the actions of heroic French people in the resistance there's nothing like that I would never do that I have no sense of national pride whatsoever I don't I don't give a damn what nationality people say they're from it's your actions that define you I think if you feel proud because of the actions of other people who said that they just waved the same flag as you there's there's something that's like a mental disease but anyway um what is it? There was a really famous quote. Nationalism teaches you to take pride in things you haven't done and hate people you've never met. And that is the face of national that is the face of national pride that I've experienced in my life. I've never seen anything good come from it. Getting a bit distracted there though. That is not a topic for now. Because right now we're having fun casting RTS. And how much damage has this mortar squad done? Okay, actually not really developing at the same rate that I would expect. Uh, that I would expect. Oh my god, for a second I thought he was like... Okay, cool, that's a trench. Um, it's not developing at the same rate as like a, a GR-34 or a PM-81 that I would expect them to develop. But I, even as I say that, in the last couple of seconds it gets two hits. Putting it up to nearly a star of veterancy. So, on its way for sure. I have to say, actually, you know, everybody knows that they're developing Company of Heroes 3. Um, it will be announced when it's sort of 18 months or 12 months away, and then we'll know, we'll have a lot more information, and we'll have a time frame and so forth. But it is interesting to think about, isn't it? And personally, if it is sort of in the European theatre, and I have to imagine some element of the new Company of Heroes game will be, uh, I would actually love to see a French faction be playable, because the French... I know that they really didn't get to take part in the war with a fully fledged mechanized army in the sense that mo like like all of the other allied factions did but the french actually did have some very interesting tank designs and units and strategies and you know it turns out that actually unfortunately for them they didn't really understand how what world war 2 would look like and you know, that's always the case. At the beginning of each large global conflict, nobody really understands what the war will really look like. So the ideas that are prevalent in the build-up to the war tend to usually be wrong. And the, um, and the tactics and strategies that emerge in the early stages of the war tend to be wildly successful for a short time until everybody has time to adapt. And unfortunately, the French were just sort of defeated before they actually had that time to adapt. But the French had some super interesting tanks. Like, look at French tank design at the beginning of World War II. I'm not saying it's good, it, but it definitely wasn't bad. And it was very interesting, like, to see those units in this game. Like, to see Abyss or a... Uh, what was it? Was it the... I can't remember the name of the... Their, their sort of medium tank, which had, like, the weird turret gun up on the side and the assault gun in the chassis. And, like, what was that tank called? That was a really good one. 
Ruse has a really good French faction. Absolutely, Dan. Absolutely. The wife is French. Nice work, James. Look, I, 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 I don't want to sound like I'm stereotyping anyone, but my my ad admittedly far too few experiences with French people and like certainly with like French women is that they are a delight. They just have this super special sense of humor. And again, I don't want to sound like I'm stereotyping anyone, but they are all also pretty beautiful. Like they just are. So yeah, way, way to go France. You got something going on there for sure. It's real. I, I see what you're doing and I like it. Um, the Char B1, that was the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I would love to see that tank in this game. Imagine microing that. If it had some kind of like fairly crap, but still usable like anti-tank turret like on the top or like just a turret and then the assault gun in the chassis and like, you know, that would be an interesting unit to see out here. The French language, you're right, Emma Duranke. It is something special, isn't it? It's just, mm, I really, really, one of these days I want to move to Canada and just get my French like learned because like, oh. French is a, just a, it's, it's a beautiful language, it's amazing. Oh yeah, the French experimental tank in Ruse. It did have a really poor AA gun on the back, but I mean, better than nothing. All right. So, over this, as this game goes on, whilst we've been talking about France being awesome and tank design and all kinds of other things, uh, Sweet Chino has been doing a masterful work of maintaining a triple cap, or at least strong control of the three victory points, if not a triple cap the whole time. And that is, that has tilted the scoreline massively, as the first Panzer IV are going to be rumbling out to the front now. Um, the Axis player actually trailing by like 190 odd tickets is pretty rough, to be honest. On Langriskaya, that's going to really mean that your late game is going to suck, because you're going to have to stick your neck out to do some pretty dangerous stuff. Watch out for these mines here, buddy. There's no metal detector nearby. You've got to be careful with this Panzer IV. Uh, but yeah, okay, so the Panzer IV will announce itself. I'm sure the AEC will be uh, scrambling. Yep, okay, there we go. To come over here and address this beast. QF6 Pounder as well, going to turn to face the medium tank. And that's a couple of nice penetrating hits there. That's going to feed a good amount of veterancy, of course, onto the AEC. So nice work there. Oh, this Panzer IV getting pelted here. Um, oh, Jadek. Uh, yeah, have fun, my friend. I'm um, glad you enjoyed the cast, and uh, yeah, catch you next time. Um, so, where's the Brit Mortar now? Okay, so the Brit Mortar now, two stars of veterancy, seven models killed. Yeah, doing pretty good this game, to be honest. And uh, Axis finally manages to take one of the VPs, but this is looking tough. Mortar MVP. Hey, Magistern. Um, yeah, this is looking really rough. This trench as well has been a big part of what is making this uh, central VP so hard for Axis to get to as well. I mean, I know this is not an uncommon strategy. We see even um, Vermac players putting trenches and things down here on the regs, but like, it's uh, it's a potent thing to be doing on this map. Langriskaya is just a, a really good sort of... Uh, focus study, if you like, of like how good MGs are in Company of Heroes for denying your opponent like ways to win the game. So that's a strong thing to be able to do. And now the AEC is pushing and UK Force is looking to get the triple cap going again. Kasim, what are you going to do, bro? Sweet Chino putting on a really good display of victory point control. Oh man, and it's not like the armies aren't evenly matched. Like, Kasim has about the same number of units of approximately equal power. Even having the Kingmaker on the field, which I still maintain would be this Panzer IV, but not really able to find any value or make any profitable exchanges happen here in mid. And, ah, uh, it's just being so difficult. Down to 154. Dare I say it, could we see a fairly quick game on Langriskaya? It almost never happens unless one player... Go okay, that was a pretty good shot. Panzer IVs can do some pretty good things. Did he actually wipe out that squad of Tommies? Ah. Sorry, there's so much going on. No, he didn't wipe out that squad of Tommies. Okay, I wasn't sure if we were on five Tommies or four before. Uh... 
can you still spam commandos from empty trenches? I don't think so, but until I see someone try, I won't know. I'm sorry. Um, all right, finally, some German forces actually make it deep down into the UKF side of the map here, and they start going to work on the AT guns. And if you lose that QF six pounder, suddenly this Panzer IV, which is already quite scary, becomes a monster. Uh, oh god, LMG forty two as well, just blazing on this retreat path, finding extra value, and Axis forces. They what? what why are we not capturing any of the VPs? Okay, finally, some pioneers. Only now. I mean, he's held this line for so long. He's been here 30 seconds, and he's just now... No! Oh, God! You have to take the VPs, sir. You're under a triple cap. I mean, it's all good and well pushing forward and finding value here, but I really assumed... I just assumed that behind this, the pioneers and some other squads, maybe perhaps the MG or the pack gun, were pushing up to capture some points, but they weren't. So he's still hemorrhaging down on 96. Kasim, my friend... We've got to get something done here. Oh, this is looking a bit... This is a bit tough. He still hasn't picked a commander. That's, that's actually correct, yeah. Um, a Stug E would be nice behind this Panzer IV right now, actually. A, assault, a Stug E on the, behind this Panzer IV would be really nice. Because if you can actually take some of these VPs... Oh, good God. Tommy's with Bren guns actually get in this building and start threatening these pioneers. They will complete the cap, and that is essential. Uh, but yeah, if you had a Stug E behind this Panzer IV, that actually makes it much more difficult for the UKF player to just come and re-grab these VPs. And since that is what this game is about, I actually feel like it's not a bad idea. Yeah, he may have forgotten about commander choices for now. He's just kind of playing the game. Uh, yeah, so I think the Stug E would be fine. Uh, I mean, it's a little late now to think about the cargo truck. Um, and we're not exactly going to be throwing... Okay, Pan's Attack is actually a pretty useful one to have, actually. So yeah, it could go for the Elite Troops Doctrine for the prospect of a Tiger Ace if we can make the game last long enough and get Pan's Attack going to make that Panzer IV. I mean, we've got a stack of munitions here. We could be Pan's Attacking a lot. Um... There's not exactly a munitions dump elsewhere, though, on that one, and a munitions dump perhaps could be useful, because we are floating a, a ton of munitions, so... Mm, I feel like maybe the Mechanized Assault Doctrine, get the Stug E now. Get the Stug E now, have access to the Mechanized Assault Group and the Light Arty Barrage with the Tiger Tank on the horizon. Pardon me. Uh, might be the one to go for. Datton, you actually think the middle one's the one to go for? What, for the strafing run and the frag bomb? The frag run for a Hail Mary is an interesting is an interesting idea. Yeah, the situation kind of is that desperate, isn't it? All right, yeah, I, I understand the line of thinking, Dat, and there's definitely merit there. Oh, wow, look at this cluster. Mortar? 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 Uh, I think the mortar might not actually be in range. It is all the way over here, and actually it's busy firing at someone else. That, that, that would have been a spicy mortar round, but not going to happen. He could get the best tiger in the game. Yes. He needs the best tiger right now. Oh god, just an avalanche of Welshmen with submachine guns going to sprint in here to do something about this command point. And yeah, that's a fallback. Hmm... And Tommies with Bren guns, yeah, they will shove aside these Panzer Grenadiers without too many issues. Panzer Shrek's not really what you want in this fight. Oh, the medics are bugged? That's very interesting of the Anki. Maybe that's why we don't see UKF players use them, like, hardly at all. Uh, in which case, I would imagine the balance team know that, but, um... I mean, I hope they do, because fixing that would be really useful. Okay, so the Panzer IV is going to come down here and try and swat the UK forces off of this point. Meanwhile, Axis forces get onto mid, and that is crucial, but we're still, we're still bleeding. Oh, my God. Kasim just cannot get a rest out here. Cannot catch a break. This is looking super bleak for the Vermac player. 27 tickets under 397. Uh, Panzer IV finding some lovely hits, mind, but it's not enough by itself. Rifle grenade! Gonna get a wipe on some Tommies here, that's nice. And, yep. 
That uh, that rifle grenade, crocker crocker crocodile. That rifle grenade is going to be good, but oh my god, oh man. That, that crocodile has to be game, right? I mean, just how do you capture a victory point when 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 your dudes are burning? And the crocodile flamethrower is, like, such a heavy example of a flamethrower in this game. It does damage so rapidly. Um, so, uh, hmm. Uh, uh, I feel like this crocodile is actually just perfect for what's going on in this game. Because you can just, any time Axis Infantry gets onto a victory point, you just burn them back off. Burn them back off. And they will be obliged to sit there and burn. We're at the point now where the Axis player actually has to let their infantry burn to death. Because if they don't, he's going to lose. So, uh... Yeah, I, yeah this, game, this game has to be over. Three star on this uh, Brit Mortar, by the way. Not often you see a Brit Mortar at three star, but it's nice to see. Such a 40k looking tank. It actually is, isn't it? It just needs, like, the heavy bolt of Sponsons, and then we're there. Oh, God. Kiss goodbye to all your infantry, friend. Sure was nice uh, having infantry, wasn't it? Oh, a pack gun. That's a good counter to a tank. <laughs> uh, and that's game. I mean, it will be as soon as the UKF player captures any victory points, but you have to imagine that's about to start happening. Yo, you got the pack gun already. You don't have to burn that one down. Oh, no. The... Panzer IV's rear armor exposed. Oh, yikes. Is the crocodile going to take out the Panzer IV? Surely not from the front. Oh, my God. He gets it. Panzer Shrek's finish on the Panzer Grenadiers. Oh, no. Oh, God. But the kiting crocodile, just too fierce, actually, still to deal with. Just outputting damage onto infantry so rapidly. Getting its first star of veterancy. Rapido. That's a tiger tank. And these German infantry are doing something about the victory points, so that's good. <laughs> Flamer tanks are no longer now. Uh, America can use flamethrower tanks because they never signed the treaties. But yeah, most countries have said that they won't use flamethrower tanks in combat. Absolutely. Tiger tank coming in for a, something of a last hurrah here, perhaps. Although the score line hasn't moved for a while. Oh, good god. Uh, I feel like this tiger won't be surviving very long, but... Uh... Where is the QF6 pounder for the UK player? Oh, it's over here. Alright. So if the Tiger can find some work here... I don't like engaging into the 6 pounder though. I feel like that is going to lose you your Tiger in a hurry. So many rounds bouncing off. So many rounds bouncing off the front of that Tiger. Flame tanks are fairly obsolete. Did you know the Chinese started using sort of primitive armoured flame units like hundreds of years ago? Pretty cool thing. When I say it's a pretty cool thing, what I mean is it's an absolutely horrific instrument of warfare and therefore pretty much the opposite of a pretty cool thing, but you know. Well, how is this Vermac player still alive? He's been on 10 VPs for a long time, and that Tiger is still alive, having gone for a quick tour of the back of the UKF player's base. Uh, not what I thought I'd see. Uh, Bundle Grenade gonna deal with these Tommies, uh, yeah, these Tommies. And the UKF infantry has actually been kind of depleted here. There are not that many units. Uh, Panzer Shrek's going to be hooning into this AEC as well. I can only assume the crocodile is being repaired. Yeah, it is. Um, and we've got Anvil Tech. Cool, we've got Anvil Tech. Doesn't that mean the engineers repair like absurdly quickly? Yes. 
Does Heavy Engineer also apply to the Royal Recovery Engineers? Does anyone know that? Heavy Engineer upgrade from the Anvil Tech, does that apply to the Royal Engineer Recovery Squads? Because I don't know. Oh no! Ah! More Axis Infantry meeting a fiery demise. God save the queen. Aha! Ah, uh, yes. Tell my butler to put on another crumpet. Okay, so the Panzer here. Gonna find a nice angle to engage into this crocodile. And uh, the engine even getting broken there. Oh no, but these, these, Vol these, uh, sorry, these grenadiers are having a tough time. But I'll tell you... Sweet Chino is probably feeling a bit frustrated at the moment. This Axis player has been stable for maybe five minutes or so on ten tickets. This Tiger tank changing the tide of battle. And double six pounder is now out. So that's going to help a lot in dealing with this uh, mighty big cat here. The, Pan the Panzer Kampfwagen 6, I believe it was. That's going to be pushed back a little here. UK forces buy themselves what looks like a decent enough window to get the double cap and that should actually close the game out uh, the tiger won't be able to get into the fight here I mean it actually could, there's nothing broken on that tiger, it's just damaged so I feel like he's actually you can't let the UKF player capture these I think that's game um, hmm. possibly calling back that tiger a bit prematurely I know that the six pounders are here in mid, but I think you have to like transition the tiger into west because if the tiger is not shooting, I think you lose the game. You just need to stop the UKF player from capturing two points because I mean, that is game, yeah. Wow, I mean, really interesting game. Um, despite having some difficulty closing out the last ten tickets from his opponent's scoreline, I think that generally was just a great game from the UKF player. Sweet Chino, just dominating Langriskaya in a way that is not often seen. Langriskaya tends to produce really close games for a whole host of reasons, but usually the score is pretty close. Not so this time. 349 ticket majority here for our UKF player, able to oust his foe in just 33, nearly 34 minutes. Uh, nice work. Absolutely. Absolutely nice work. And double UKF mortar as well at the end, still firing away. So um, I think he used the call-in ability clearly twice to get both the six-pounders and both the mortars. Really nice there. Nice to see UKF mortars. I mean, I know I already said it, but I'm going to keep harping on about it till somebody puts them in the game. I think UKF, I think every faction should have access to an infantry squad weapon, which is indirect fire and has a smoke option. Just think everybody should get that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was... Uh, that was really well played. Yeah, the crocodile actually was pretty pivotal. Nice, uh, good good point out there, Dan. Uh, able to obliterate German infantry and protect the victory points when it mattered the most. Let's just quickly take a look at the Brit mortars and see. Yeah, looking all right. I know these numbers are a bit skewed because like they were call-ins, not, not produced, but I think it still calculates the efficiency correctly. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's that's pretty good to see. Nice to see those units being used well. Cool. Alrighty. Well, there we go. There we have it. That was pretty awesome. What a day of games that we've had today. Fantastic stuff. Um, actually, you know what? No, because we had a few missed games, didn't we? But I still feel like we salvaged it. That last game on Langriskaya and the one before were both good fun, I think. So that's pretty cool. Um, and the Homeworld Deserts of Karak game was just another treat. That game continues to deliver. We're not having a, we're not had a, not had a dull game out of that one. So um, glad to hear some of you guys picking it up as well. That is a game that uh, just is a fantastic RTS, and um, just you, that's money well spent. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that's going to be the end of today's stream. Unfortunately, I have to go and do some work now. It's uh, it's three o'clock here. That gives me two hours before everyone goes home for the day. So I've got to make calls, do emails, and do all of that fun stuff. Uh, but uh, I will be back on ba -ba 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 -ba. I'll be back on Wednesday casting in the evening at 1700 hours GMT and again on Thursday so uh, that's when you can get your next fix of magpie thank you very much everybody 
for tuning in. Chat, well, once again, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for your comments and giving me the benefit of your fantastic knowledge because, uh, yeah, a lot of you really do know these games really well. Um, and that really helps. So, uh, yeah, um, that's going to conclude this stream. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I'll see you all, um, hopefully, on Wednesday. Cool. Till next time, Magpie842, signing out.